I'm Adam Grant. I'm here with Stephen Dubner, the author of the Freakonomics Enterprise, along with Stephen Levitt. Stephen, welcome. Thanks, Adam. Uh, your books have been fascinating to read. They've obviously created an international explosion. Your latest is Think Like a Freak. What motivated you to write this one? Well, boredom. No. Um, Honestly, after so we wrote the first one together, which was an accident. I was a, I am a journalist. I had written an article about Steve Levitt and his strange brand of um, e- economics, economic research, and I was working on a totally separate book about the psychology of money. I was really was and remain really interested in that. So I was interested in behavioral economics, what we now call that. So I wrote about Levitt. Then we decided after this article. Uh, someone decided that it would be a good idea if we teamed up, and we did and wrote Freakonomics, which was very successful. We didn't plan on it being successful. We didn't plan on working together even once. Then we thought, do we want to do another? And we took about two years to decide if we did and if we had, if we could come up with enough good material for a second one, which we did. Then for a third one, we were pretty sure we weren't going to do another because we just didn't want to, you know, milk it. Um, contra the wishes of our publisher and agent, <laughs> you know, you have to. Any time someone sees a franchise presented to them, they want to take it and exploit it. And we just, you know, we had slightly different incentives. We felt like we'd profited and been really lucky to get to that point, and we didn't want to exploit it uh, unless we had material that we were really proud of. So again, it took us a couple years to come up with a framework for a different book, and that's this this third book, Think Like a Freak. And basically, what it, what happened is. We hear from people a lot, emails mostly, which is great. I mean, you know, of all the things that the digital revolution has produced, one of the coolest, simplest ones is you can now contact people who write books that you read, which used to be, you used to have to write a letter to the publisher and hope they pass along, which they never did. So we hear from people with all these problems and questions and queries about the way the world works, and we couldn't answer them all. It's hard, you know. To answer one email well could take forget about one day, could take months of research. So rather than trying and failing to answer a shard of those questions, we thought, what if we could write a book that basically deputizes the entire world, or whoever wants to, to think like we do, to to kind of develop a set of rules, a kind of blueprint for essentially problem solving. Um, It's not always problem solving, but mostly that's what we try to do. And that's what this book is. It's meant to be a fun, engaging, practical way to think about the way the world really works, think about the way incentives really work, the way that people really respond to incentives rather than how they say they might. And then if you're trying to solve a problem, big or small, in business or government or in your own family, you know how you can maybe slightly increase your chances to actually solve it. That's the idea. Well, you, you certainly accomplish those goals. And you start with the premise that there are three words that all of us should probably utter more often than we do, which are, I don't know. Yeah. Where did that come from? Um, well, I think that came primarily from the fact that Levitt and I, Lev, Steve Levitt, my co-author, you know, he lives in a world of, in the world of academia, where you are. I'm a writer. I've been a journalist, you know, for my whole adult life. And both of us wouldn't have a job if we pretended we knew all the answers all the time. The whole premise of what I do as a journalist is go find people who know things that are interesting or worthwhile or hidden and ask them about it, try to find out. So you have to acknowledge what you don't know. Levitt in academia and you in academia, you know, what academic, what good academic research is, like good medical research, like good uh, physics or engineering research, is trying to sol- trying to figure out questions um, where you don't yet know the answers. So once you come in with that mindset, you're going to have a different approach. You're going to acknowledge what you know, which may not be very much, and what you don't know. And then you're going to, in order to try to figure out what you need to know, you're going to develop a framework for experimentation, gathering feedback, and so on. Now, as totally ridiculously obvious as that sounds, what I just said, there are huge quadrants of modern society, particularly in business and in government, where people are constantly pretending they know the answer to a question or the solution to a problem. And I get it. I understand the way the incentives work. I understand that reputational, you know, reputation works. Nobody wants to be the ignoramus or the dummy. So if I'm a politician and someone says, you know, governor, blah, blah, senator, blah, blah, you know, we just had this terrible mass shooting at a school. If you could do anything, if if all options were available to you, what would you do to prevent that future in the future? The way the world works is 
I'm, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna do these three things and that's what'll do it. Do you have any evidence? Is there any empirical reason to think that that actually would work? Often, I hate to say it, no. And so you see that in certain realms, politics and in business where the incentives are different, there's a big incentive to get it right in business, but there's also a lot of, you know, for lack of a, a, a more sophisticated term, peer pressure to be the gal or guy who knows, who has the plan. So, you know, a really basic, um, you know, rule of thumb is, uh, um, you know, or a, a, a basic MO that happens very frequently now is a firm will say, we need to come up with a plan or a solution. Let's get our 20 top people get together in a room for an hour. That's 20 person hours and let's come up with the best one, the best idea, and then put all our resources into that and go. What are the odds? I mean, if this were science, what are the odds that that would bear a good result, almost none. So then there's a counter example of someone like a Google who lets its engineers take 20% of their time and work on their projects on the side. The idea being, you know, have a lot of ideas, most of them will be bad, but let the triage process work and let people figure out through scientific or empirical ways how they can really learn stuff. And then once you've done some experimentation and some small scale work, then maybe put some resources behind it. So that's something that I think business needs to do much better, but I think many businesses are moving in the right direction and the digital revolution helps that so much because it's now so easy and cheap to gather data and do A, B testing or A through Z testing to tell you what's actually working. Do you have favorite tests that you're seeing recently that kind of represent this revolution in a mm. positive direction? As opposed to, you know, we can all name bad decisions that should have been based on evidence but weren't. Yeah. Are, there, are there any standout examples for you? I'll tell you one example. I don't know how well it's working out. I did some reporting on it a few years ago. I have no idea how well it's working out. I like the idea because it's uh, the federal government doing it, and the federal government has typically been really bad. At it. I mean, they're the worst. And if you think about it, it makes sense why they are on the top theoretically in some ways of 50 state governments and all those municipal governments under them. So they're not in a position really to go micro. Um, and I, I understand that. But what they did with this race to the top program in education, I thought was a really good idea. And again, I, I don't know how well it's gonna work out. But basically they set up, first of all, a contest, which means that there are incentives that presumably are gonna work better than no incentives or than, than there's or better than some kind of negative reinforcement that we're used to. And basically, uh, you know, Arne Duncan, Secretary of Education, the president said to all the states, hey, we need to think of ways to improve or rethink our education system. And believe me, you know, I could talk about that for years because education is such a complicated box with so many inputs and so many outputs. It's, it's really easy to look for magic bullets, you know, hire, pay teachers more or get rid of the unions or smaller class size. Everybody likes those magic bullets, but it's a very complicated scenario. So basically the Department of Education said, we go to all 50 states, each of you, we want you to try to come up with a good program, a good idea, a good solution that works. And if it works, we'll pay you for it and there's a good chance and we'll run it up and we'll kind of, you know, standardize it. That's the right kind of thinking. Um, think small, don't pretend you know the answers, um, experiment, get feedback. These are all the premises of think like a freak really. And, and there's one example where even the federal government, which we're not used to thinking that empirically, I think, you know, gave it a good shot. You have some fascinating examples of the book uh, that probably stretch beyond what most readers would themselves be willing to do. Uh, one of which is you actually got people to agree to let you randomly assign them to do things like ask for a raise or yeah. quit their job or even break up with their significant other. Uh, what was the logic behind that? Yeah. What did you learn? So this came about because of a, uh, a podcast episode. We do Freakonomics Radio podcast and public radio show. And we did an episode that I, I love. It was just... To me, this was a great topic because it's a blend of data and empirical thinking with narrative storytelling, which is my tradition. Um, so it was called The Upside of Quitting. And it was basically making an economic argument to some degree, which is um, considering that most of us have been conditioned to not quit. We've been conditioned to think that quitting is an equivalent of fail, is a failure, a form of failure. Um, how do we know that that's true and how much of the counter might be opposite? So, um, 
you know, if you think about a project, a job, a war, you know, all a relationship, all these things that you might could quit, but because of sunk costs and because of peer pressure and because of, um, you know, your own moral position, you might not want to quit. We tried to look at, you know, what is the upside of quitting? And we, we argue that there's a significant upside and that people are really bad at um, estimating um, opportunity costs, what they could be doing if they could quit and so on. So, but the fact is, it's really hard to get data on this because it's not like you can go into, you know, one big school district and say, you know, I'm going to take a thousand kids and I'm going to totally mix them so that their grades are, you know, equivalent on either side. And I'm going to randomly force half of them to quit school, uh, don't allow them to go back to school, and then 10 and 20 and 30 years later, see how their lives turned out. That's one way to, you might do that experiment, but of course we, we couldn't do that. The people who tend to quit school tend to be a very different population than the people who don't quit school. So to compare them after is not equivalent. So what we came up with was a website called Free Economics Experiments, where we offered that if people had a decision to make. It wasn't necessarily something to quit, although usually it was. If they had a decision to make, um, should I quit my job and go back to grad school? Should I join the military or stick with my job? Should I leave my boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife? Uh, all different kinds of things. Should I get a tattoo or not? And if they had a decision and they couldn't, and they really were on the, really truly on the fence, then we offered to help them out and flip a coin for them. And we asked, all we asked is that they fill out a survey beforehand telling us about it, and that then they tell us whether or not they followed the coin, because we have no power to make them follow the coin, and then we would follow up with them and, and do research later to find out uh, what their outcomes were. And so to uh, many different categories, a variety of outcomes, and the research isn't done yet, but the short answer is that when people quit something, that they were generally really worried about quitting, their lives tend to get a little bit better. So even if they didn't get a lot worse, you might argue that it's a, a, pretty, good, uh, a pretty good bet. So basically, I think we should all consider quitting as a really good option. Um, but you know, it's hard when you have the words of Vince Lombardi, you know, a quitter never wins and a winner never quits, which was, wasn't actually Lombardi originally. And Winston Churchill, telling people never, 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 never give up in anything large or small, great or petty. You know, you have these great people and that gets in your ear and it convinces you that, oh man, if I start a project, I have to see it through. But if you just for five minutes, spend some time thinking about the sunk cost and thinking about opportunity cost, then you can really get to different places. So that's what we were trying to accomplish there. Well, on the opposite of quitting, yeah. uh, I think another one of the most audacious things that comes out in Think Like a Freak uh, dates back to Super Freak Economics. Uh, I remember reading that you said that, that basically terrorists should buy life insurance and yeah. thinking there was an awfully interesting way that you could <laughs> use that information, which you then yeah. went and did. Yeah. Tell us a little oh, bit so about you thought, that. Yeah, you, you were thinking a step ahead of most people reading no, I, that, right? No, I was just right with you thinking like a social well, scientist. Well, a lot of people were thinking, so, so right, in Super Freak Economics, we described this algorithm that Levitt worked on with a, a, a British bank that was trying to catch terrorists from nothing more than retail banking data that was, for our purposes, anonymized. And so there were all these metrics that seemed to indicate someone who might be, uh, you know, either, we couldn't tell from their banking data. It wasn't like we know that they're buying bomb making materials, although that would have showed up, but they're not that stupid. But if they were consorting with other people, um, but then there were other clues. Um, that would uh, raise the, that would move the needle for indicating that someone is, is quite possibly involved in it. But then there was one argument that we made in Super Freakonomics that if you really, um, one really good indicator is that young men who are prone to thinking about terrorism are not going to buy life insurance from their bank because why would you? Because if you, if you kill yourself in the commission of a crime, it's not going to pay out. So why would you waste the money? That was the argument we made. So basically we were saying, here's this algorithm we made. Here are, what, here are the metrics that comprise the algorithm. There's one or two that are too good. We're not going to tell you. But here's, by the way, is another really good one that we will tell you, which is that you should buy life insurance from your bank. Now, this was done for real. The algorithm was real and we were really trying to catch people. And it worked to some degree. We think it worked to some degree. But the life insurance thing was just a red herring or it was a, it was a trap. And the idea was that very few people buy life insurance from their banks anyway. Like very, very, very few people, even though most banks offer it. And the same is in Britain. 
But by putting that in our book, and then when we went to uh, Britain for book tour, what most people were saying when they interviewed us is, you idiots, why would you go to the trouble to build a, a tool to catch terrorists and then tell them how to evade it? And then we were just like, well, yeah, maybe we, hmm, huh. Because that's the tool. Yeah. So, um, because that was a tool. So then the algorithm was already in place uh, by that point. So anybody that saw us talking about this or saw journalists there yelling at us for giving away this clue, what are they maybe now a little bit more likely to do if they're guilty to cover their tracks, go buy some life insurance from their bank? Then the algorithm being in place, we could look at that data and see who already fit the profile and now additionally ran out and bought some life insurance and that increased the likelihood even a little bit more that those people were bad guys that generated a new smaller list that we then passed on to the authorities there. Do you know what was done with that list? <clears throat> so my colleague Levitt presented it to the head or near head of uh, the intelligence division. He presented it, it was literally an envelope with a wax seal because he'd been given the envelope from the bank because we were, again, we weren't, allowed to see any identifying data on any of the people. And it was a little bit, it, it was a little bit um, maybe James Bond outtake combined with uh, the very end of Raiders of the Lost Ark where they get the Ark and it, and it goes into the warehouse and the camera pulls back and you see that there are eight million boxes. So we have no idea uh, whether this list that we were quite sure had some value for anti-terror uh, purposes, um, whether or to what degree it was put to use. Uh, that that wasn't part of the game we were allowed to play in, basically. Yeah. yeah. So in closing, um, other than <clears throat> saying, I don't know, when working on <laughs> Freakonomics, the book, the radio, the podcast, the movie, um, through that whole process, what's the biggest lesson you've taken away about how to think like a freak? Oh, the biggest lesson... Um, I, I guess I should know that by now, shouldn't I, since this is kind of my thing. Um, you know, I, it's amazing that I'm coming up blank to, to the question that should be the first one that I don't come up blank to. Um, I, I guess I really, um, so this is more of a philosophical answer than a, a kind of tactical or strategic answer. To me, the challenge is always going to be the blend between the empirical or scientific or data, whatever you want to call that, and the intuitive or the human or the humane, whatever you want to call that. And what I mean by that is, especially in this era of big data, which is kind of what we've been doing for a long time now, not as systematically as a lot of firms and governments are doing it now, but you know, we believe in it. We believe that if you get a pile of data representing a million decisions, that that's better than asking three people what decisions they made. So while I very much believe that to be true, and I very much applaud all the instincts for all of us to kind of work with data in aggregate to distill the biggest truths. I also know that we're humans and that we're fallible and bi I shouldn't say fallible, although we're fallible too. We're biased in a lot of ways. So that even if you could tell me or I could tell you the most foolproof strategic way to reach a decision or the best decision to make or the best strategy or the best set of numbers to embrace, there might be a lot of good reasons why you still won't be successful. And that's because the people that you are now employing that strategy on or the people that you're now offering those incentives to don't respond the way you think about the problem. And that requires a lot of humility. Um, and that's something that people in government, in business, in academia, in journalism, uh, everywhere where, you know, uh, uh, people in all those fields are really used to like, when we come up with something and we put it into play, we're used to people like snapping up and saying, okay, we're gonna do this now. That's a lot of power, that's a lot of authority. But with that power and authority comes, I think, the need for humility to understand that when you make decisions like that and put out incentives, whatever they are, big or small, governmental or non, that there are people on the other end of that and how it affects their lives the decision makers don't often think through very well how they'll respond to the incentives and so on. And so that, to me, is the balance to be as scientific as you can while understanding that even if I can present 100 people with the science that says, hey, you should really do this, 90 of them might have a really good reason for not wanting to do it. 
they might be wrong. I might be right, but it doesn't mean I'll win the argument. And being right doesn't win that many arguments, um, weirdly enough. I mean, there are a lot of people who are right about a lot of things who, who don't get their way. So I think that's really the, the trickiest part. I mean, I'm working on a, a radio podcast episode right now about the flu vaccine. Very, very simple. It's pretty effective, the flu vaccine, about 60% or so. Influenza, along with pneumonia, is always one of the 10 leading causes of death in the US, which most people don't think about or don't know. And, um, and yet very few people, a, a lot of people who should get the flu vaccine don't. Why? It's kind of a conundrum. So we're going through all these different layers of behavioral and uh, PR um, and uh, um, you know, financial decisions to try to figure out how is something as seemingly simple as this so hard to accomplish? And that is what I'm constantly reminded is the people, the smart money may be smart, but unless it can deliver on something that really raises everyone's behavior, then it's not worth that much. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Adam. Thanks.